Hey guys and welcome back to the Hellfire Comms Ghibliphon. Today we're going to be taking a look at Whisper of the Heart, which I have spelled Whisper of the Heart for some reason in my <laughs> films folder. I don't know why. I guess I was just in a rush when I was downloading it. Uh, this is one of your favourites, isn't it, Rich? I do really love this film. It's just, it's really cute and sweet and it's got a little thread throughout it that it's just me down to the ground. Hmm, interesting. I am intrigued. I did have to skim through it to make sure it was in sync. I saw some fantastical elements, but it's mostly a teen romance thing. So uh, yes. ho hopefully it's um, more like Laputa and less like Ocean Waves, at least in terms of the relationship stuff, because <laughs> uh, one was definitely better than the other in that regard. Anyway, rambling. If you guys need help syncing our commentary to your video file, check the video description for instructions. Otherwise, we're going to get right on into it in three, two, one. Hokey Koki, Whisper of the Heart. What you got for me, Rich? So, uh, Whisper of the Heart came out originally in 1995. The dub didn't happen until 2006. Huh. But it is a delightful film that has a surprising amount to do with the song Take Me Home Country Roads. Like, it's the song that plays at the start of the film, and it actually features throughout in various guises. Originally written by Bill Denoff for John Denver and Taffy Nivett. Hmm. The version that's played here is actually by Olivia Newton-John, because she did a cover version in 1973 that actually reached the top ten in Japan uh, at the time. Okay. So... Uh, Obviously, it was very, very popular when that came out, and that pretty much explains its existence here. I was actually going to ask if this was a dub choice or not. No, this is actually in the original film, and there is a Japanese rendition of Country Roads at the end of the film, but it also appears in the film itself, so it actually has relevance, uh. which is... Really cool, actually. All right, well, uh, I'll keep an eye out also... for those uh, comparisons. Then, you're a fan of country at all, Rich? Uh so I certainly don't dislike it. I like the vibe of country music. I just don't really listen to a lot of it. Like the, the most country that I probably listen to is like maybe a bit of Dolly Parton, and maybe uh, obviously. Early Miley Cyrus and early Taylor Swift had a bit of country in them. So, I'm certainly not averse to it, as I know there are quite a few people who hate country music. <laughs> but it's not one of those genres that I just go, oh yeah, I'll put on a bit of country music. It's it's not that type of relationship. Yeah, there was, of course, the theme to Cars, uh, a cover of Life oh, is a yes. Highway by Rascal yes. Flatts. But uh, getting off the subject here... Whisper of the Heart is, like I said, a teen romance with some fantastical elements. Uh, one protagonist, see right here, who is, Rich? Shizuku Tsukushima. Voiced by? Voiced by the lovely Brittany Snow. Ah. Who most people in the world these days would recognise as being Chloe in uh, the Pitch Perfect franchise. But obviously... Most geeks would recognise her as being the original voice of Namine in the Kingdom Hearts franchise. I don't, I don't like feeling attacked for knowing these trivia bits, Rich. I'm not asocial. <laughs> I'm not an what the fuck is asocial? Antisocial. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Britney Snow is pretty awesome, and obviously she was also in Hairspray as Amber Von Tussle. So Britney Snow is. Awesome. There are a few other big uh, voice actors in this film, although they're all quite young. One of them has also been in a Kingdom Hearts game, but I'll leave him until he appears later on in the film. And the other was a Disney star as well. But we'll leave that until we get to her as well. So, is this person, this girl even going through some, like, school troubles, because uh, we did have to do, like, a, a quick pass over, like, the first ten minutes of this. And are these her results? Because obviously I can't read Japanese. No, these are library cards. Basically, Sh Shizuku really loves books. 
you can see part of the reason why I relate to her as a character because I am the literature nerd of the group. And basically what she's seeing on these cards is she's seeing the same name turn up again and again and again on all the books that she is getting out of the library. And she's kind of going, who, who is this person? Clearly I should probably get on with them because we're reading the same books. Yeah. And that's going to formulate the start of the film as she tries to find out exactly who this person is. And basically, so the name that she's got is Seiji Amasawa. And she's going to try and find out who that is. Okay. I'm noticing a lot of, like, junk in uh, her parents' house. Like, stacks of newspapers, tons of books. Are they hoarders, by any chance? Well, uh, her mother is a graduate student. So she's obviously very busy, and her father is a librarian, so obviously he's going to have a lot of books about, and also that explains entirely why Shizuku loves books the way she does. Oh, that's kind of sweet, actually. Yes, and also obviously this is Japan, so... There is maybe a slight difference in terms of how people have their houses, I suppose but that's kind of making a wildly sweeping assumption. Yeah, it's neither here nor there, Rich. Come on, let's not insult our Japanese audience like five minutes into the film. <laughs> to be fair, we'll have probably already done that in the past, like, nine movie commentaries at this point, in some form or other. I did think my 20-minute racial, like, slur fest during Pompoko was a bit much, but, you know, one has to make these kinds of <laughs> risks in order to, you know, broaden <laughs> one's artistic spectrum. <laughs> oh, dear. Very upbeat so far. Like, very warm colours as well. It's the type of film that it has a few darker moments... But it is, for the most part, a rather uplifting, enjoyable film. And it is pretty normal for a Ghibli film. Like, it falls into the same category in that respect as Only Yesterday, Grave of the Fireflies, uh, Ocean Waves, From Up on Poppy Hill, The Wind Rises, in having that... It's very normal pretty much most of the film, it just has a few fantastical elements that will make so much sense in the context that they exist within. The way you describe this film, it kind of sounds like a Japanese version of The Page Master. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Really? You've not heard of The Page Master? No! It's that one film with Christopher Lloyd and, um, fucking Macaulay Culkin. And it's half live action, half animated, and he goes into like various books inside a library. Like everything like comes to life and becomes animated and whatnot. And he has to go through like uh I think it's Pirates, Horror, Fantasy. It might be Adventure, Horror and Fantasy. Uh so yeah, it's it's nothing like that. Okay. <laughs> well <laughs> It's much more normal than that. As I said, it will make more sense when we are later in the film. I don't really want to spoil it because it is... It's very important to the plot of the film. It's not a spoil, major spoiler or anything, but you kind of want to have that emotional journey to get to that point. And here we have Yuko Harada, who is voiced, quite obviously, by Ashley Tisdale. Ah. Uh. Who most people will recognise as being Sharpay Evans in the High School Musical franchise, but obviously she was also Maddie in The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and Candice in Phineas and Ferb. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it works quite nicely because I think at the time when they did this dub, Britney Snow and Ashley Tisdale were like besties, and obviously they were both kind of Disney stars, so that works. And here's a little bit of Country Roads. Because basically what Shizuku has been doing is she's been translating the uh, lyrics of Country Road into Japanese. But obviously, in an English dub, that doesn't quite make sense. So it's basically just her 
coming up with her own version. Yeah. But it's it's quite cute. I love how they got Ashley Tisdale to sing within the first ten minutes of the film. That's getting your money's worth there, I think. Well, of course. I mean, that's also part of the reason why they went with Britney Snow and Ashley Tisdale, because both of them are singers. And that's that's quite awesome. This is the second Ghibli-related song thing I've been assaulted with today, because before we um, started recording this commentary, I finished editing the commentary for My Neighbor Totoro, so I had the Totoro <laughs> song stuck in my head for most of the day. Yeah, so... Tonari no Totoro, 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 Totoro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there will be... M- multiple songs like that throughout the entirety of Ghibli that will get into your head. One of which is actually in The Cat Returns, which is effectively the sequel to uh, Whisper of the Heart, although it's more oh, spiritual sequel than anything else. Okay, I thought they kind of seemed like similar. Yes, they are very connected, but there's actually something a little bit different with that. So, Whisper of the Heart was directed by Yoshifimu Yoshifumi Kondo and he was like a massive up and comer in Ghibli so he'd been the animation director on Anne of Green Gables, Sherlock Hound, Kiki's Delivery Service only yesterday and was also working on Princess Mononoke which was obviously getting worked on around this time Uh and he directed Whisper of the Heart and he was expected to become one of the top directors at Studio Ghibli alongside Miyazaki and Takahata Uh and was intended to become their eventual successor. But unfortunately, in 1998, just one year after Princess Mononoke came out, he died of an aneurysm. Oh, fuck. And his his death is said to have been caused by excess work. Wow. And that seems to be the main reason that Hayao Miyazaki's first announced his retirement in 1998 because obviously he saw what had happened to the man who was meant to be his successor and thought I need to take it a bit slower. Obviously Miyazaki returned to Ghibli again numerous times but Kondo's death seems to have influenced Miyazaki to work at a much more relaxed pace because obviously seeing someone effectively overwork themselves to death kind of puts things into perspective, I suppose. Yeah, it does. Luckily, I do less plays for a living, so I'm never in danger of anything that stressful. Yeah. But it's it's kind of heartbreaking because upon watching Whisper of the Heart, it would have been amazing to see more of what he could have offered. But obviously, that's, that's just life. I think we have our... Uh secondary protagonist here, so let's hear who he is voiced by. Who, you take one listen to him, it's very obvious. It's Riku! <laughs> yes, this is David Gallagher, most well known for being the voice of Riku in the Kingdom Hearts franchise. And yeah, He's pretty awesome. And it's quite cool because obviously you've got a a massive Disney connection for the three young characters in the film. And they're all connected via that Disney link because obviously Britney Snow and David Gallagher both in Kingdom Hearts, but also Ashley Tisdale and Britney Snow also Disney stuff and it all, all ties together. Hmm. She's uh, she's angry now, but you know she's gonna be pining after him later. But her heart might even be whispering. <laughs> that was bad, even for you, Tom. I know. Don't be passive aggressive just because I told you to stop with the fucking verbal ticks earlier. Well, to be fair, ah! it's just one of those things. <laughs> right, I'll give you that one. You, everyone gets one. <laughs> Look at that not Coca-Cola oh. machine. I love it. Really? Was it that big a deal? Or is it just the book that she's reading? I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's it's the book. I have been there with reading books that I've just been reading and just going... 
Oh god! I mean, the book thief was a pretty good example of that. I got to like the last bit of the fil- of the book, and it was just like, oh my god! <laughs> what did it get really mad and someone actually broke in and stole the book before you could finish it? No, it it was more. It gets really really sad right at the end, and it's just heartbreaking. Like I think I would basically be ugly crying for days if I ever tried to read a monster calls. Aww. Because I was ugly crying through the end of that film for the last 20 minutes. So reading the book, I think I'd be really emotionally traumatised. But that's such a beautiful story. When Quasimodo ugly cries, do you think he just calls it crying? So yeah, this is Shiho Tsukishima, Shizuku's older sister, who is voiced by Courtney Thorne Smith, most well known for being Alison Parker on Melrose, Georgia Thomas on Ali McBeal, Cheryl in According to Jim, and Lindsay McElroy on Two and a Half Men. Hmm. And that's that's probably her most famous roles. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm drawing a blank here. Don't worry, so am I. This is parent code for wake the fuck up. Except it's her older sister doing that, because obviously her older sister's just like, <laughs> lazy 14-year-old. I was wondering why she had a bunk bed. Uh, I guess uh, it was the secret twist that, oh my gosh, she has a sister. Pretty much, yeah. But I have to say, I, I, I do find this relationship quite interesting because obviously, if you look at people when they're like in their when they're like fourteen to when they you get to like nineteen twenty and so on and so forth, you the nineteen twenty year olds look back and just go, oh my god, fourteen year olds are just so immature, like and so lazy sometimes, and you're just like, good god. Ah, uh, there's the iconic uniform that I've seen on so many bits of art and whatnot. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I have to say, to be fair, the older sister's stupid for dropping that from that height because <laughs> as if that's going to land right in her hands. Yeah, it just blows into a nearby gutter and, oh no, they can't pay their bills for the month. Exactly. Just like, you just don't do it. <laughs> kind of lost count of how many, like, subway cars we've seen during the ghibli Fun so far. I don't know, but the count is going to go up, because obviously there is one particularly inf- well, not infamous, but famous train sequence um, in a certain film that's going to be occurring later down the line, oh. which it's like one of the most iconic images in Ghibli. I love it. It's beautiful. Kitty! Yes, you're going to be saying quite a few cat-related things throughout this film. He's a fat fucker, isn't he? Oh, yeah. You haven't even seen the half of it. Wow. That was shade even by cat standards. Bitch, I am trying to enjoy my train ride, do you mind? The cat likes advertisements, I see. Yeah, the cat is adorable. But also, what's really quite cool is that cat is actually based on a real cat of sorts, I suppose. Uh Uh-huh. I can't remember where the... I'm going to try and find the information. Because it's a really cute story, actually. He's tipping. He's tapping, he's tapping. So, okay, nothing's happening. It's just a cat quest right now. Well, exactly. I don't know why I vocalised that, but hey, the audience is in the know, I guess. 
<laughs> oh, it's not going to show me. Oh, no, it might do. I, I, I found his character entry on the Studio Ghibli Wikia. That's not helpful. <laughs> Was it just say fuck off and concentrate on the commentary? No, it just didn't give me the information that I need, but I know that it exists. Basically, what I think is the case, I could be slightly wrong in saying that the cat is actually based on a cat that I think was around the Ghibli offices quite a lot. And so he inspired the cat here. I think it was a big, big fat cat. The cat was a real cat, and it's got some relation to Ghibli, but I honestly, I can't remember what the fact is. It was on, I'm pretty sure, one of the, like, special extras or something on one of the DVDs, but I can't remember and I can't find it. Oh, I wonder how many people are actually using their real-life DVD copies to sync up to this commentary with. Well, to be fair, this is what they should be using, all their Blu-ray Richie, copies, because obviously... Richie, Richie, I told you, I'm getting triggered. <laughs> yeah, you've got, you've got to use your actual copies, because you, you've got to be actually legal, you know, guys. Yes, let's not incriminate ourselves further. Oh, you ever just filed a cat before? No, because that can frequently lead you to... Dangerous alleyways where potentially not pleasant people may be like this. I mean, I certainly would not be going up that pathway because, <laughs> no. Huh. You bring up an interesting point. Do you think cats work together with gangsters to, like, mug people? <laughs> I mean, it depends on the type of cat because it might be a cat that, you know, is just rolling around on its own terms, but it may also be a cat that is deeply ingrained in the society of a gang and therefore will happily help it because obviously they're giving it food of some description. Jeez. I didn't know where this conversation was going when I opened my mouth to begin with, but I'm pleased with the results. Where is this goddamn cat? The cat's just gone walkies, basically. Oh, don't worry. The cat will return. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I love the backgrounds. It It's a beautiful film, and yeah, Whisper of the Heart did do very well in the grand scheme of things. Mm. So it was the highest grossing Japanese film on the domestic market in 1995, Holy earning 1.85 billion yen in distribution income, and has received very positive reviews from film critics. It has a 91% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes and Time Out London included it in their top 50 animated film list. It was also included in Film 4's top 25 animated film list. And Anime News Network's Michael Toole gave it an overall grade of A-, calling it beautiful and evocative, a fine tale of adolescent yearning and aspiration. <laughs> Such a cat thing to do to just taunt dogs like that. Yeah, I'm just going to have a nap here. <laughs> Such a cat thing to do. Well, it's a cat, what do you expect? And also clearly a cat who is a bit of an asshole, so it turns to be the way that these things roll. Well... Better of an oxymoron there, mate. You could have just said cat, really. <laughs> like, I love my cats, but they can be right arseholes. Like, one acts nice, but is a sneaky little shit who will go after the others when you're not looking. Tends to be the way. Alright, let's see what we've got on our hands here. Mystery, one hopes. Well, definitely a certain amount of mystery, because it's a very interesting little shop, I feel. I love those quaint little, like, mom-and-pop bookstores. Well, it's not quite a bookstore. More if you look at the stuff hanging around here. I mean, it looks more like a home, to be fair, but it's much more of an antique shop, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. I may have been thinking of something else. A different film entirely. Who knows? Hmm. 
Hmm. I've seen that cat before. I think you probably have, yes. <laughs> He's very, very important and very awesome, actually. I don't know why they dress me in the clothes of man, but I like it. I'm not giving them back. Now, something that's actually quite fascinating, so as with a lot of Ghibli stuff, Whisper of the Heart was based on a manga. This was Mimi o Sumaseba, which was originally created by Aoi Hiragi, and it was serialised in Shuesha's shoujo manga magazine Ribbon between uh, August and November 1989, and there was a single uh, Tankobon volume released in February 1990. A second manga by the same title, or, well, by the same author titled Mimi o Sumisaba Shiawase na Jikan, was serialised in Shueisha's Ribbon original in 1995, and the spiritual sequel to this, to the film adaptation, of Whisper of the Heart, The Cat Returns, was turned back into a manga by Aoi Hiragi under the name Baron Neko no Danshaku. So it was very much a case of literature influencing film into influencing literature, which I find to be quite awesome, actually. Haha, uh -huh, I see it. Did you see it, viewers? It said Porco Rosso on the clock. Ah. Not quite Pixar tier when it comes to like callbacks or call forwards as Ghibli, but they're there if you're looking hard enough. Yeah, I mean, I think the main reason for that is the Ghibli are very much more in line. They, they don't tend to like breaking up the illusion of the film's world. Yeah. So much like. Disney and Pixar are so happy to just slot in little references wherever they can. And while Ghibli will do it, I mean, there is a slight reference to Kiki's delivery service in this film. There's also uh, Totoro, and obviously Porco Rosso's name being in the clock. But outside of that, they don't tend to do it all that often. Yeah. I think it's because, yeah, they want the world of the film to be pretty self-enclosed. And that's fair enough. This is a really intricate clock. Kind of reminds me of the stuff Geppetto would make in Pinocchio. Oh yeah, and I mean, to be fair, this lovely elderly gentleman who is called Seiya, no, not Seiya, that's, that's Shizuku's father, uh, this is Shiro Nishi. And he's pretty awesome. He's also voiced by Harold Gould, who is most well known as being Miles Webber, on the Golden Girls and Martin Morgenstern in uh, Rhoda. Obviously, a lot of us probably wouldn't necessarily recognise him for things, but he did do a lot of TV work. He was in Dennis the Menace, The Twilight Zone, and many other things. And... Oh yes, he was also... Uh, Old Janahi in Brother Bear, he was the grandpa in Freaky Friday, he was Grandpa Spencer in Stuart Little, and he also did a lot of TV work. And like, his voice sounds familiar to me, but I wouldn't be able to place it in a thing. But either way, he's just got that really nice, grandfatherly uh, style voice, and that's just pretty awesome. God, she's fucking bucking it, but then again, the library waits for no child. Well, of course. That was for the audience. Just in case it wasn't on Jesus! <laughs> yeah, I, I think at this point I'd just be going, Oi! Watch it, you crazy girl! Wait, that was your cat? Yeah, and also he's kind of related to uh, that old gentleman. Uh huh. 
<laughs> I like these two. I think they'll make a good couple eventually. I, I think so too. It, they've got that whole thing going for them where they're butting heads, but it just it works so well. Sounds like working with me. And also, I have to say, I, I do know that feeling of you're having a brilliant day and then all of a sudden somebody ruins it just by saying something. You're just like, really? For God's sake. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about you. It, it It's more... When... For me, at least, anyway, it tends to be when dealing with members of the public. They're always the, the, the biggest pain in the backside. Well, I'm not exactly in the private sector, mate. No, but... Generally dealing with the members, general members of the public, it, it can be frustrating because... For some reason, when people put themselves in the position where they become a general member of the public, <laughs> they suddenly lose all sense of common sense and become slight assholes. And you're just like, I'm sure in any other circumstance, you'd be a perfectly normal and pleasant human being. But for some reason, in this instance, you've become a raging asshole who doesn't seem to understand that I am also human. So yeah, the the customer may suppose well, they're supposed to be always right, but generally the correct answer to that is no. The customer is not always right. The customer can go sod off; they'd make my life so much easier. Ooh, <laughs> rare instance of Richie anger. Mm. That that trust me, that's not Richie anger. That's just Richie moaning. Richie anger. You don't tend to want to get it to appear because Richie anger is quite. Volcano us. I want. To, I've just made up a word there. I don't even care. The term is volcanic, mate. There was a Doctor Who episode about it. Yes, th that would indeed be the term. But clearly, when I was saying it, it just didn't come to my mind because <laughs> I'm going slightly loopy at this point in my life. And to be fair, I don't care. That, that's why I just said to be fair again because it really is becoming a verbal tick. Oh my god. <laughs> You made me notice it now, goddamn you. Well, I'm the one who has to edit all this shit. How do you think I feel? <laughs> Let's share umbrellas. Red and blue. Ruby and sapphire. I got Ultra Moon today. When are you getting yours, Rich? Well, I was hoping it would turn up today, but it's probably going to be tomorrow when it arrives. But that's fine, because really I, you know, need to record my next playthrough walkthrough, because, um... At the moment that we are recording this film commentary, my so my Eternal Sonata playthrough is pretty much coming to its close in the next week, and that's just like, ooh, so I really need to record the next one, but then I really want to play Ultra Moon, so I'm going to have to try and balance that out, I feel. Well, I failed, how about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm being expelled <laughs> as we speak, they're writing the papers. Yeah, also, God, I remember doing tests at school. It's never a fun experience. Yeah, who are you? He was the guy from earlier, wasn't he? The, the, the baseball playing dude. Oh, yes, this is uh, Sugimura, I believe. And he is voiced by Martin Spangers. What? Did you make up that surname? No, uh, that is actually a, a real surname. And he is most well known, I think, for playing Rory Hennessy on Eight Simple Rules. Oh. Between 2002 and 2005. Okay. He has also been... So he auditioned for the main role of Malcolm in Malcolm in the Middle and was close to getting it, but didn't get it. But he did get a guest spot in the show's pilot episode. Oh, that's cool. 
And then uh, he's also been in 90210 as Barry the Barista. There's nothing really much here. There, I suppose there is Malcolm the Wraithmaster in Kim Possible. <laughs> Jeez. That's probably mostly it. I mean, there's also Hunter in Grey's Anatomy and Young Sam in True Blood, but mm, that, that's probably about your lot for who you'd probably recognise him as. It's just her friend's crush. We don't really know that much about him. Basically, yes. Her friend's crush and her friend, so it's kind of... It's a little bit awkward, but... Eh, what's the problem? Well, the problem is quite clearly that this guy is a bit of an asshole. Who's gonna move first? Oh, okay. <laughs> that was a lot more downplayed low-key than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit. You know, it's nice to have um, a break between like the talking animal films and whatnot. You know, I know there's going to be a fantastical element soon, but you've got to have that, that human element as well, you know? Oh, definitely. And I mean, I would say that... A lot of the Ghibli films are perhaps at their best when they are the slightly kookier, crazier films with more fantastical elements, because that's... A lot of the stuff that they do thrives on that, and that beautiful art that they do. Uh -huh. But they do do a very good job of creating more realistic anime narratives, and yeah, I mean, obviously I am entirely biased towards... Whisper of the Heart, but I think it's one that does a very good job of portraying this more natural story with more realistic characters that I think manages to achieve what it's going for a lot better than, say, Ocean Waves or Only Yesterday do, because pretty much all of the characters are really likeable, even when like they're being slightly arsehole-y, like Riku. And to be fair, Shizuku's a little bit impatient with things and gets really stroppy, but it's kind of cute in how it all works together. And, but despite that, they're likeable. And I think that's the thing that works for Whisper of the Heart so well. Yeah. Because a lot of the stuff with Ocean Waves is that Mikuko, I think it was, she's meant to be this character that you're you're supposed to get the reason why the main character falls in love with her. But actually, you look at it and you just go, uh, she's actually a manipulative cow. Like, really, you should not be going there. That's a relationship that is doomed to failure, if you ask me. Yeah. And so you spend a lot of the film batting against that. You can't quite settle into it. And obviously, the problem with Only Yesterday is that it's just such a slow and boring film, that while the relationship between the two characters works and is good, it never quite manages to entirely grab your attention, just because of the rest of the film. Yeah, it also kind of comes out of nowhere at the end. Yeah, whereas what works here is because the entire film is set up around that principle, so you're kind of aware that there's going to be something going on here, but also because the characters are likeable and engaging, it really does just carry the story along, and that's why it works. You watch that cat's going to come out of nowhere again and lead her on magical adventures. <laughs> And yeah, this is going to get super awkward, I can tell you now. I thank God we cut away from it for the time being. <laughs> uh, I can just break in, maybe. It's only an antique store, who cares? 
And also, to be fair, it's an antique store, so there's no real surprise that it might be closed at certain times of the day, because... The cat moved! Well, the cat didn't necessarily move by himself, because it's not that type of film. But... He's probably, like, the Mr. Nishi's probably just taking him away to just give him a little bit of a tidy up or something, perhaps. Also, I have also been there of uh, just entirely focused on something, headphones on, don't recognise anybody coming into the room, because <laughs> headphones can sometimes be quite good at blocking out noise. Yeah, I wear them all the time. Like Jesus, just block me out from the outside world. Relationship drama in 3, 2, 1. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I told you, it's going to get super awkward. Well, not so much awkward as it is heartbreaking. Well, yeah, there's, there is that. See, I actually have human empathy, Richie. <laughs> what are you saying I don't? Thank you very much. <laughs> that was the most arrogant thing a guy could say, I think. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Although, to be fair, there is m more arrogant things you could say. Like, I am the best president of the United States of America. Nobody comes close to me. Everything is brilliant. I mean, that would be more arrogant, but, I mean, who would do that? Oh, Richie, your satire is biting and oh-so-witty. Who could you possibly be referring to? <laughs> You done fucked up, boy. He really fucked up. This neighbourhood's so pretty, even if it is a little bit, um, janky? Is that the right word? Uh, uh, what connotation are you using for janky? Here. Like, it doesn't seem like the most upscale neighbourhood ever. Okay, I wouldn't say janky is the right term for that. Yeah, I'd yeah. I'd say it's more... Quaint? Uh, uh, quaint. Eccentric. Quirky. Yeah. Is probably a slightly more accurate description of it. I, I, always, seem to, I always associate janky with... <gasps> no! Feelings! Get away! Get away! I know! <gasps> ah, there's the awkward part! Yep. Yeah, I, I told you it would come in. Well, <laughs> at least nobody called Sora, let's put it that way. <laughs> it, 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 excuse me, it'd be Roxas. Because Kyrie's in love with Sora, and Naomi's in love with Roxas. Wait a minute, does that technically mean that Kyrie's in love with Roxas and Naomi's in love with Sora? Because they all are technically part of the same person. I mean, this is true, but that would also mean that they're all in love with Shion. And by proxy, Ven is in love with all of them. Oh my god, fuck this franchise. <laughs> <laughs> we all love it, really. It's, we it's, it's, I do, I do. I adore yeah. the Kingdom Hearts franchise. <laughs> yeah. It's just eccentric, but it's sincere in its eccentricity. And that is why it works. Well, my heart's broken. Go fuck yourself, whore. Bye.
Yeah, so uh, basically nobody's happy right now. Yay! Even the dog's angry. Jeez. Clearly it's going, you asshole, you broke his heart. But then also he broke another person's heart, so he kind of deserved it. Yeah, what goes around comes around, kiddies. Exactly. <sighs> well, time to delve into the romance novels again. Trash ahoy. No, what she's doing is, well, she was going to sit down and just go, okay, I'm going to do homework, and now she's going, nope, my life is over, my best friend's crush has a crush on me, how the hell am I going to face her, because this is now super awkward. Ha, uh, it's wonderful never having to deal with that sort of situation. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so alone. Yeah, don't worry, I know the feeling. Um, um... Oh, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me here, the one that matters. <laughs> Oh, dear me. Well, it's certainly one thing that I'm going to attempt to do at some point in the near future is get myself out there to try and make sure I'm not so alone Aww. anymore. But Good luck to you, mate. We'll see how that one goes. Yeah, just have fun with <laughs> it. Yeah, because basically, getting a little bit deep here, my attempts at having relationships have been a disaster so far. They've all died before they've even begun. Boy, preachers of the choir there, bud. Yeah, it's just like, really? Oh well. Boy, this commentary got awkward all of a sudden, but then again, <laughs> kind of following the tone of the movie, I guess. Oh wow, this is getting a B right out of the gate, I can tell you that much. Excuse me, we haven't gotten to the kind of extra bit of the film, like, we're just about hitting... Roughly the halfway mark now. No, that's that's the baseline score, mate. It goes up. Oh, from that's there. good. Okay. Yeah. That is fine. Good. I have mentioned uh, before that I go in like with an idea of what my final grade will be, and it can either go up or down from there. I'm pretty sure, from what I remember of the Whisper of the Heart and just my general feelings of it still now, it's probably going to sit about an A for me because that's that's me. Okay. Yeah. But. There is obviously bias there because I do really like Shizuku's character and love the fact that she's a character who loves to read and there's a little something that's going to come in not very long at all, which makes me appreciate her character even more. Well, you haven't stroked him yet. The cats are made to be stroked. Can you relate to that, Rich? Even the lyrics part? Um, I mean, to be fair, I have done that in the past. Mostly in the sense of... Because I've written two pantomimes and had to try and come up with ways of making some of them fit a bit better. And trying to just alter them a little bit so that they work with the plot. For example, I... So when I did my Cinderella pantomime, because it was the year that Frozen came out, I had to get Let It Go in there, obviously. 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 And it was just trying to find a way of turning those lyrics into something that would actually fit the story of Cinderella. So I gave it to me, obviously, um, as buttons. And it was the magic flurries from her dress into her shoes... She's a beauty that even Prince Art Charming can't refuse, and just trying to shift it up just enough so that it fits with the meter of the song and it works, but it makes sense in the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that sort of stuff. So I, I have been there. Oh. <laughs> this is so weird hearing Riku's voice coming out of, like, another animated character. It is kind of crazy. I think I remember when I first watched Whisper of the Heart, I didn't quite have... I don't think I had quite that level of connection with Kingdom Hearts at the time. Uh-huh. 
Because I was surprisingly late into the Kingdom Hearts franchise. Like, I think, if I recall correctly, I didn't play the original Kingdom Hearts until just before Kingdom Hearts 2 came out. So, I was very, very late to the party. And obviously, this film came out in 2006. Although, how long? So I would have been 12, so I would have been at the anime club, so I would have gotten into anime, so probably would have been about the time that I would have seen it, I would have thought. So, that's probably why I don't quite have the same dissonance in my head of going, that's Riku. I have it more now than I did then. But, still. Gotta say, I'm really digging the music, the score so far. Oh yeah. It's, it's a great score. It's done by... Yuji Nomi, which, who has, is basically only down on Wikipedia as being the Japanese composer who worked on Whisper of the Heart and The Cat Returns. Obviously, he's done more than that. Yeah. So, apparently he's worked, well, he's done more than that, but not necessarily many that most people would recognise, I suppose. But that is fine, because he does a very good job for these two films, and that is totally fine by me. I'm glad they kept the composer for the spiritual success for uh, The Cat Returns. Oh yeah. It's probably about the only thing they sort of did end up keeping. Because obviously they couldn't keep the director, because obviously he'd unfortunately passed away. Yeah. It features an entirely different cast. I'm just going to check one voice actor who... Oh, good. There is one voice actor who did carry over. And that makes me happy. Okay. Gaze into my eyes. You are now a cat. <laughs> You've basically summed up the cat returns. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, jeez. Hmm. The Baron, he doesn't have a lot of stuff going on in this film, at least not until... Well, obviously the second half of the film, uh -huh. but I think people liked the idea of the Baron so much that that is why the character ends ended up being a thing, because people wanted to explore the Baron more, and that's pretty awesome. Are you not expecting an actual reply, lady? I'm I'm just a statue. Well, she reads a lot of books. She can probably figure it out herself at some point, you know? Oh, I should probably go and eat. You know, life can't all be about watching statues. Yeah, it would probably be a good idea. It would also probably be a good idea not to stay in someone else's house and not see them at all for a long time, so like from light until dark. Yeah, I mean, we've al we've already filled up the awkwardness quota for the movie. Probably best exactly. not to go even further beyond. I do quite like what we're going to see here. It, it's a really... It, it's probably my favourite bit of the film. Oh, okay. You'll understand why when it happens. I will say it's uh, kind of odd we haven't seen any of the uh, quote-unquote fantastical stuff so far. I was expecting it to be interspersed a little bit more. No, it it really isn't. And I th it, it works very well for this film, I feel, because it's a film that is so much more focused on the reality and the relationship between these two that is burgeoning as we go. Okay. This is something that's also quite nice, is that Seiji here, because that's obviously who this is, is... He, he makes violins. 
he he wants to be a luthier, which is a uh, maker of violins, basically. It's it's not something that ever actually I think appears that often in any sort of literature or film or whatever. You don't really get violin makers. No, you don't. It's it's just nice to see because it's something slightly different. And it's nice to see a character who is very invested in a project and the, their dream. We're nearly there. Come on! Oh boy. I can probably guess what it is. <laughs> they really went all in on referencing that thing, didn't they? They did. Jeez. Oh, just it's it's just beautiful. And now I shall play through the fire and the flames. <laughs> no, we need to have a proper country roads here. I just love this so much. Can't sing my ass. This is beautiful. Ten out of ten. Obviously, she's voiced by Brittany Snow. It's going to be beautiful. Old people shenanigans are the best. Best old people ever. Best old people <laughs> ever. <laughs> Just every time I see this, just I have the biggest grin on my face ever. Mm -hmm. It's just delightful. Basically, I just want to sing along every time I hear it. <laughs> I've kind of got chills, I'm not going to lie. I would say it's the highlight of the film for me, because it's just, it's, it's just brilliant! <laughs> just a little bit of grunge in there from the old folks. Regret and sorrow. Richie, you know that's not going to sync up. Jesus. I, I don't even care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just. Oh. <laughs> it's, just, it's just perfect. I've never heard a tune coming that well out of a recorder. This is truly Ghibli magic. <laughs> Bravo! Bravo! Oh, it's just so delightful. Yeah, that was great. I'm going to look up the rip of that on YouTube when we're done. Good luck. You might have a bit of a trouble finding it, because I know that they were they were pretty... At least a few years ago, anyway, they were pretty good at removing it. Which was just like, <laughs> I, just, I just want a copy of the damn thing. Why don't I just watch the part of the fucking movie again? Probably be easier. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah... Now she's basically figured out that this is the guy who was reading all those books. Well, hmm. <laughs> oh. What? Did she... He can play violin. He played your favourite song. You sang along with him. Why is it a problem? They're like, holy shit, what are we... I haven't seen this in many years. Yeah.
Ah, mm. <laughs> uh, young love, awkward as ever. Yeah, they're just like, <laughs> you're gonna bang at some point in your life, because obviously you can't now, because you're far Richie. too young. Take it from PG <laughs> to PG-13, why don't you? <laughs> I will have chiselled an electric guitar by the time you return. Of course, and obviously we need a sequel to Take Me Home Country Roads, the uh, Shizuku edition, <laughs> shall we say. Drive me down the interstate and it's shout of the heart instead. <laughs> Uh, very interesting body language, though. Definitely, yes. I didn't need these kind of personal attacks. Didn't need it. <laughs> to be fair, I'm still sort of there with I don't know what to do in my life. Dude, I'm like five years older than you. Piss off. Well, I know. I mean, to be fair, I sort of know what I want to do in my life. I want to be a writer. But obviously, getting there is a bit more difficult than really is delightful, but there we go. I'm 29 in a week. Eat shit. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. That's the thing. Oh, this is sweet. It, it, it's just it's just so well done, and you can see what I mean by these are likable protagonists, which is why you can totally get behind wanting them to get together. Because you're you're just going yes, go for it, just 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 be together. fuck's sake. Again! Again! <laughs> well, you see, once you get into this sort of hole, you really do end up getting a little bit stuck on it, to be fair. I know a few years ago, I was definitely in that hole. Can you stop describing it as a hole, please? Well, that's essentially what it feels like, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I know! Okay. Super awkward! Keep eyes forward at all times. No, don't look at me! <laughs> and then she's just like, You're an asshole! <laughs> she's like, You don't have to wait for me, but actually, you know, that would have been sort of alright because then I wouldn't have been like later than late, but. Yeah, well, I think you're reading into things there a little bit. Where it travels first? It does indeed. Oh, okay. There's a little something there. Yeah, it, it's less awkward than it was before. Yes, otherwise you will not be able to summon Satan. Yeah, I have to say, I'm very glad that I don't think I had any tests like that where it was just like... Just like, you're going to have a test tomorrow based on this. I'm just like, no. Because that, that that just didn't happen. We were given at least a bit of notice before tests arose, which is quite nice. Uh... 
Oh. Ha, all the talking is gonna occur right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much more compelling than like ocean waves or fucking only yesterday so much more compelling it does this right and that's what I love about it it's got a bit of cheekiness to it which I like yeah it, it's cause they like Shizuku and Seiji butt heads quite frequently but also there's a just a joy throughout all of it it's not looking at love and thinking this is hard and depressing and difficult it's thinking there's hope and even if there may be challenges love is love and that will carry you through a lot of stuff that's beautiful that's beautiful rich I probably nicked it from something or other. These <laughs> types of sayings tend to be very commonplace. So is he, like, training to be a Lutheran, whatever the fuck you said, or just, like, playing the violin? He, he wants to train to be... A master luthier. Or luthier, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced. It's luthier it sounds more right than Lutheran, which I think is a whole different kettle of fish. Well, it, it's either luthier or luthier. I suppose luthier would probably be more accurate because it's Italian. So, yeah. But basically, so his family, his parents anyway, have said, you can go to Cremona, Italy for two months with a master violin maker. See whether you're actually up to the task. And if you are, then we'll happily let you go do that. If not, you're going to freaking high school, mate. Yeah, that's more than fair, I think. <laughs> and to be fair, I think that's what I'd probably do if I was a parent. It's just like, if your kid really, really wants something, then you kind of have to say, well, go for it. Try and get your dreams if that's what you want. But then make sure you do have a backup, because otherwise you can end up in really not very good positions. Oh, It's just so cute. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know they're watching us, right? Hmm. I mean, it's the most romantic place in the world. So, yeah. I think you'll come back a bit more equipped to deal with romantic feelings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the bants. Yeah, we, we're getting the fuck out of here. And she, yeah, to be fair, I'd be like that as well, just going, Oi! We were having a moment, you assholes, and you just ruined it! Yeah. Especially considering, you know, that's sort of her last sort of moment with him before he goes off to Italy. Aww. It's just like, oh. But yeah, we are very close to the Fantastical Elements beginning, so that's quite fun. I'm not sure if I want them to happen. No, I'm kind of happy with this. It will make sense, I promise. Okay. Well, it makes sense that the daughter of a librarian, a book-loving nerd, would have such visually stunning imagination scenes. Well, I wonder why. 
Yeah, she's in love and she's slightly heartbroken because her very soon to be new boyf is going off to Italy and leaving her all alone. Boyf? Short for boyfriend because why not? That's a new one on me, mate. Then again, I don't get my slang from the 1970s, so... <laughs> to be fair, I don't even know if that is actual slang. I just sort of went with it. It, it felt right to say at the time. It's just maybe, yeah, I should really not really use that much slang in the grand scheme of things because it sounds weird coming out of my mouth no matter what I say. <laughs> it's okay, you're a trendsetter, mate. What a comfy looking house. It, it is nice. Eh, uh, well, I could stand to have more, I suppose. Also, I'm loving that they have Pocky on that table. That's awesome. Well, now's the time. Ghibli, do your magic! That fucking Pocky. Yeah, Pocky on the table. Pocky and tea. Mm -mm. Pocky, cookies and tea. It's perfect. Although, to be fair, I'm not the biggest fan of Pocky, which is kind of not great. I, I, fe I feel as someone who sort of likes Japanese culture and stuff, I should like Pocky more, but I don't know. Yeah, it's fine. It's just one of those things, to be fair. Oh, there it is again, for God's sake. Uh, I don't really don't like sushi, so that, that basically killed... And I don't like rice either, so that basically killed me out of most famous Japanese dishes. So I'm screwed if ever I want to go to Japan. <laughs> And now you see the other reason why I really love this film, and why I really associate with Shizuku, because obviously my dream is to be a writer. And so I totally get this, and also, oh my god, that dog is so cute! <laughs> oh. It's very easy to overlook the fact that uh, her friend and her friend's dad were spatting with each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, it doesn't matter. You go back to the hell that is domestic strife, and I'm going to go home and write, write, write! Was that meant to be a reference to a previous Ghibli protagonist? What? Muta? No, the little girl. Maybe it's just because I was editing Totoro today. It put me in mind of it. I don't think so. It's fine. Don't if worry only about because, it. if only because the Totoro reference in the film is in the school library. Basically, Shizuki takes a book, and among other books, you can see a volume with the inscription Totoro on the shelf below, fourteenth from the left, after four blue books, and there aren't any other Totoro references. Okay. Is that okay, Mr. Ghibli? <laughs> Can't believe I just called Hayao Miyazaki Mr. Ghibli. That's what I was angling for. Well, I mean, to be fair, Miyazaki basically is Mr. Ghibli because he is... Obviously, Suyo Ghibli is far more than Hayao Miyazaki, but he's the face of the company. Always has been, always will be, even long after it is fully closed. But, so he is effectively Mr. Ghibli. He's a really nice character, this old man. Oh yeah, definitely. Mr. Nishi. It's your first Pokemon. Enjoy. 
It's in a book. <laughs> no, it's a gemstone in a rock. Oh, yes, yeah, a geode. Of course, it's a geode. I was wanting to say geode, but then I was just like, hmm. I'm going to avoid saying that because I might be slightly wrong and I don't want to seem like a complete idiot. Don't want to piss off the geodes in the audience. Sorry, the geologists. Although there might be, like, animate geodes in there. I don't know. Our audience I is mean, diverse like that. Exactly. I mean, there might very well be an animate geode. It doesn't surprise me if there would be. I mean, to be fair, actually, no, it would surprise me because animate geos are slightly terrifying and could theoretically, you know, take over the world. But as an idea, the geo is quite cool because it's effectively that whole diamond in the rough type dealio. Ah, uh, I see. you got to polish your ideas as well, Rich. Exactly. This is all just a metaphor for imagination, I guess. Well, it, it's more a metaphor for ideas than imagination per se. Yeah. Because obviously you can have an idea that might get you so far, but actually on the face of it, it's kind of a bit of a crap idea. But if you dig a bit deeper into it, you can find what actually makes that idea tick and... What's good about it, and if you kind of knuckle down into that, then you can get the gem to come out a bit more. And here are the fantastical elements that return into the film. Basically, it's Shizuku figuring out the plot of her her novel, Ooh. and that's just quite awesome. And the Baron, the lovely, awesome Baron is voiced by Carrie Elwes, who has obviously been in previous Ghibli films and obviously is most famous for being Wesley in The Princess Bride, Dr. Lawrence Gordon in Saw, and being in things like Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I can fly. Well, I'm a talking cat, you don't think I can fly? Of course. Did they bring um, the Baron's VA back for the Cat Returns? They did indeed. Carrie Ellis is the only voice actor to appear in both Whisper of the Heart and the Cat Returns. And that is basically because the Baron is the only character who also appears in both films. That's fun. I mean, if people fell in love with that character, I think the person who voiced him should return, you know? Of course. It, it is only right. I don't know whether it's the case in... Uh, the Japanese dub. I'm going to see if that is actually right. No, in the Japanese, they didn't get the same voice actor back. But obviously, ah. Oh. But obviously, when you think about it, Whisper of the Heart's dub came out in 2006, and The Cat Returns came out in uh, Japan. No, and came. The Cat Returns came out in the West in 2005. So actually, they did the dub for The Cat Returns before they did the dub for Whisper of the Heart, by the looks of things. Okay. And obviously it wasn't that far apart in terms of release, so it just makes sense that they used the same voice actor. Do you ever go to the library to try and get ideas for your stories, mate? Uh, no, largely because I just buy my books because that's the way I roll. But I definitely, of all the books that I read, I do take a little piece of it away into my memory and it definitely inspires me when I write because I'm constantly thinking about how things have been done before and what I want to evoke, and previous literature inspires that. And obviously, in, well, 
Because nothing exists in a vacuum. Vacuum? Vacuum? Vacuum. You are constantly influenced by things, and my style of writing is paying homage to my influences, and just wearing my heart on my sleeve and saying, this is the thing that influenced me. I love it, and I just want to share that love with you guys. And that's basically how I write. Yeah. That's basically just because, so, so obviously I've said before that the inheritance cycle, so Aragon, Eldest, Brasinga, and Inheritance are what inspired me to write in the first place. Because Christopher Papaolini, who apparently actually is a bit of an asshole, but move aside from that, he started writing Aragon when he was 14. I mean, you can kind of tell it when you read Aragon, because it is very derivative of Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and all that jazz. It's what you'd expect. But... Because he started writing that when he was 14 and he got published, and it was a very successful book and obviously got made into a film, which mm, the less said about that as an adaptation, the better. Yeah. But he managed to do that from such a young age, and that's why I started writing my first book when I was 14. I still kind of haven't finished it. I mean, I've finished two drafts at this point. I'm just trying to edit it to get it into a position where I'm happy to publish it, effectively. Or try and get it published, anyway. And... Yeah, it all came from reading that one book and thinking, I can do this too. Yeah. And that's just awesome. That literature, literature can bring that out of people. What's it even to say about these, like, imagination sections? They're just gorgeous. Oh, God, yes, that they're just beautiful and. They're just telling the story that Shizuku is writing, and it, it's great. Who cares I'm writing, damn it? Do you ever get those kinds of, like, imagination bursts? No, largely because I know that if I was up until four in the morning doing anything, I would pretty much be dead the next day. And in my head, I'm just going, no, don't be that stupid. Go to bed, you idiot, so that you can actually function in the morning. That said, I have had a few, like, I think, in terms of writing anyway, the latest I've ever gone is maybe one, two o'clock for an essay that needed to get done that hadn't gotten done for whatever reason. It wasn't a regular occurrence, obviously. But it did happen on the odd occasion. And, yeah, that was the latest I'd ever go with writing because I knew that it needed to get done, it was going to get done, but I wasn't going to work until ridiculous o'clock in the morning because then I just wouldn't be functioning and then I'd fall behind on other stuff. So that's basically how I always worked. Didn't really have a chance to cover this while it was happening, but I, f I thought it was so sweet how the male protag just stayed with her on his last day, just in the library, just reading books together. Yeah, it's it's just a super cute relationship, and you're effectively just going, just just go for it, because you you clearly work so well together. I mean, obviously they've not lived together in that obviously changes so many things. Yeah. But on an ideological level, and in terms of their personalities, they just work. That guy's my favourite voice actor, the one who said, yeah. I think he really earned that paycheck. <laughs> I don't think he's even mentioned in <laughs> the voice cast on Wikipedia. Well, I wonder why.
Huh. Interesting reaction. Well, I mean, to be fair, it's a... Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> well, I have to say, that's the reaction that I probably have to a lot of things. I mean, that's effectively why I haven't moved out from home yet, because I can't afford it. Monet, and... yeah. It's much more reasonable as a reaction to go, can you afford it? If you can't, then don't do it, just stay here, save up the money, be smart, but I totally understand that you want your independence. So if you want to go, go, but obviously, we'll see how it goes. My hope, for me anyway, is that in a couple of years' time, when I've managed to save up enough, once I've got myself a car, and I can save up a bit more, then I might be able to afford a deposit on a house, which would be quite nice. Mm -hmm. That's the joy of living at home and not having to pay that much rent. You save up so much money. And you spend it on things that, that, that you don't even need. And then you're out of money. And then you're back to square one again. Basically, yes. <laughs> Well, there's a cat, and there was a holiday. Oh, we speaking rhetorically. Oh, getting a bit personal there. Yeah, the terrifying thing is, is that in today's day and age, that is terrifyingly accurate. You can get a degree with and have so many prospects, and then you're just working like, part-time jobs in a shop, because no one will hire you because they want you to have experience, but you can't get experience until you've had a, a job like that. Ugh. But you can't get the job until you have experience, and you just end up in this cycle that is, it's just awful. Yeah. That's basically why I ended up getting treated for depression, because I got stuck in that cycle after graduating from uni, and just my brain couldn't handle it. Because, obviously, I went through school being one of the smart kids and was so used to everything going well, at least academically, and in terms of work. Obviously, rest of my school life was awful in terms <laughs> of bullying, because, uh, of course. Uh -huh. But I, I generally always succeeded at school. And I, for the most part, succeeded at uni, although I did develop a bit of an inferiority complex because everyone around me was so bloody smart. Well, that's like, how do you think I feel when I work with you, mate? Well, yeah, but to be honest, I, I'm not, when I'm doing these sorts of commentaries, I'm not actually being the smartest that I probably should be, because <laughs> I'm, my smarts come out when I've actually sat down and thought about things and I'm working through something. When I'm actually go talking off the cuff from pretty much anything, I ramble a lot, as you probably noticed. Yes, yes. Well, uh, let's get off Richie's pity train, shall we, and focus yeah. on the film. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I ended up on that sinking spiral of getting stressed because of after uni and... Yeah. Yeah, so it's a terrifyingly accurate point, that, in the film. Yeah, all, all this argument was stressing me out, so I just thought I'd have a quick fag. That's faggers and cigarette. Please don't demonetize this video. Ah, <laughs> oh, the difference in words between the UK and America. Obviously, the one that I do always find quite funny is uh, Fanny Pack. Yes, thank you, Richie. <laughs> uh, I can probably guess why she doesn't want to go on to, like, junior high and whatnot, or the thing after junior high. She's got a boyfriend waiting for her. Oh, yeah, that's that. But also, if you look at it, part of the reason why she's effectively rebelling against the idea of high school is because her 
older sister is a college student and is just working part-time jobs and not really getting anywhere. Yeah. Her mother's a graduate student and is just spending every waking hour of the day studying and not actually, you know, properly looking after her. And so she's kind of looking at that idea of studying and just going, I don't want that, I want Seiji, and I want to write. And it's totally understandable. I mean, there was someone that I knew at school who was far smarter than I ever was, and he he, he was the smart kid of the school, but he went to uni and basically rebelled because I think his mother had put a lot of pressure on him yeah. to do well at school, and he just sort of went, no, I just want to live my own life. And even though he was far more intelligent than me, I don't think he ended up doing nearly as well because he just didn't care so much about studying anymore because he wanted to do his own thing. I mean, when you can get your hands on the Chaos Emeralds, who needs education? Oh, sorry, it was a Chaos Bird. Well, that was a... No more chocolate milk before bed, I think. I'm coming to bed. Oh, never mind, floor will do. Oh, that's depressing. That's all she has to remember him by. Yeah. Why didn't I get a photograph? Oh, it's okay. I can use a flashback. It's fine. <laughs> oh, heartbreak's awful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Hello? What the fuck? It will make sense. Don't worry. I can probably guess what this is supposed to mean. What do you think it's supposed to mean? <sighs> oh, never mind, he didn't die. No, it it it's it's definitely not him dying. This is not that type of film. Oh my god, you've de-aged by about twenty years. <laughs> and your hair is a different colour and shape. <laughs> and also you're not wearing a hat. Hope you're not expecting me to proofread this for free. Granddad's got to eat, you know. No, he very much wants to read it because... Effectively, it's the story of his little baron. And it's from the girl that his grandson has fallen in love with. And so, obviously, it's quite important to him. And maybe two, three, maybe ten hours tops. Shizuki's reaction there to delivering the the first draft of the book. It's basically every writer, I feel, when they've finished the first draft and they get shown it to someone, they're just like, uh, please read it. Uh, it might be shit. Oh god, it's probably shite. Uh, crap. Uh, don't read it. Uh, I want to change this and this and this and this and this because it's probably really boring and I'm sorry I've kind of screwed up. But actually most of the time, while well, the first draft is often draft is often a mess, once you've started getting into it and editing it and polishing up those diamonds and getting rid of the chaff, you can actually create something quite beautiful. You just need to have faith in what you're doing and just think... Show it to someone, have faith in that, and they will see what you're not seeing and help you get it to a point where it is brilliant. 
It's not even a writer's thing. Like even with videos, sometimes the first oh, yeah. draft isn't enough. Oh, definitely. It, it's a general creative's thing. Yeah. That <laughs> Is that what they the call time. us nowadays, jeez? Well, yes, creatives. Basically covers writers, artists, filmmakers, video makers, etc. Not Let's Players, get the fuck out of this fucking generalisation. <laughs> Sorry, it took me several years, and like she puts her head up, and there's like age lines all over. You could put that scene on basically any show you don't like to piss people off, I think. <laughs> I've never thought of doing that, but you are so right. Why is Stephen fucking crying all the time? Just punch the diamonds in the face! <laughs> mm-hmm. You should know a thing or two about that, Mr. Second Draft, Third Draft, Fourth Draft. Yes. He understands. Of course he does. The cat doesn't really seem to care. Yeah, the cat really doesn't care. Don't worry, he'll return though. He will return, actually. Just in a slightly different vein to how he appears here. She's in love with him. Obviously. Well, she sang a whole song and everything. You know, the romantic connotations, you laughed at it. Oh, it's okay. Exactly. He's, feed he's feeding her noodles now, it's fine. And also he said that he really enjoyed her book, so... It's entirely okay. This is the most classic of adorableness, I think. Oh. oh, you're going to have so much dirt on him when you see him again. <laughs> so yes, now we're actually going to get the true story of the Baron. I hope he gets a credit in the book at the end. I'm sure he will do. But yes, the story of the Baron is a rather heartbreaking one. This is very romantic, but I can't help but feel that, that they didn't actually finish these scenes, because look, no one has any features. They're going for an artistic style. I know style. what they're going God. for. Then there was a flying pig, and I don't know. I, I carved the dude's name on my clock. I don't want to talk about it. Don't make me cry. <laughs> sad old people are the worst kind of sad people. No, but they, they do really talk at the heartstrings, and that is the point.
Ah, uh, the geode. I'm getting actually emotional, Richie. As I said, Whisper of the Heart is a damn good film, and I love it so much. And now, I hope you can see why. This better not end on a bittersweet ending, otherwise I'm giving it a D. Because I'm going to be crying all over the B and it'll turn to a D. It, it's not going to end on a bittersweet ending. I mean, I will point out that I think there are some people who I think actually criticise the film's ending, actually. But it is something that Hayao Miyazaki, who, did, who was the general producer and screenwriter for the film, he did defend the film's ending, saying that it was his idea for what happens. And it's arguably very cliché. But I feel that it is, it's it's adorable and does really fit the film, if you ask me. That's about time she actually slept in a bed for a change. I know! And thank God she has, because now she might actually, you know, do well with things. <laughs> yeah. The most comfy of duvets. Well, of course, it's only right. I like how he called her a warrior and not a princess. Yeah, it's a nice little touch. Yeah, just a little thing. Alright, I'm gearing up. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the tears. <laughs> you might not necessarily get tears, maybe happy tears, perhaps? But it, it's it's just a cute finale, I feel. Oh, the room feels, like, so much more empty and cold now that her sister's not there. It's also quite literally cold. <laughs> well, maybe that's what they were going for, so... <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yes, and please make sure you put a coat on. That's no, cool. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, that's just so cute. And also, I mean, to be fair, they should both be wearing helmets, but that's just the safety freak in me going, Oh my god, this is not okay! Love doesn't care for your shitty safety requirements! <laughs> Aww. Bit corny, but I'll allow it. I'm, I'm totally okay with this. I'm okay with that. Sorry, a bit of a delayed reaction, though. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, the smart thing would have been, you know, to get off and walk it up, but there we go.
And this is also really super cute because obviously they're, they're a partnership. Just do oh, it so right. To be fair, if I had done that, I would have been like, oh, no, you can sod that. <laughs> Get a taxi, I'll meet you where we're going. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how he knows about this spot, but either way, it's it's beautiful. The dude plays custom violin songs for her on a violin he no doubt made himself and shows her the best view in the city. Fuck, can I like regress about 10, 15 years and date this dude? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I, th I think a lot of people would totally do that, yes. It's just so beautiful and I love it. And as I said, clearly so cliche they get to watch the sun rise together, but it's just it it works. It works so well and I love it. And it's portrayed nicely as well. Like it's not ham fisted or anything. They just took a bike ride to the top of a hill and watched it. Yeah, it's just it's very natural. And that's why it works. Okay. <laughs> Smash cut to credits, their relationship didn't work. <laughs> no, it, it, it's cute. Ha! <laughs> <gasps> okay. It, it, it's just cute. The reason Miyazaki wanted this is because it means that Shizuku and Seiji commit to something, and that's, that's just beautiful. And now we get to hear the Japanese version of Take Me Home Country Roads, as translated by Hayao Miyazaki. Oh, beautiful. I will say I kind of agree with the ending thing. I expected a little bit more, but as is, I'm going to give it a B plus. I love the characters. Animation and music are top-notch, as always. The story is beautiful, the relationship is beautiful. I wish they'd spent a bit more time focusing on that than rather than the writing side of things, but it makes sense in the context of the film. So, yeah, I'd put this definitely on the same level as Laputer Castle in the Sky. Not quite Norseka level, in terms of Epic Nos, which is probably always going to get my favour, but yeah, really good film. Definitely in the top percentage of the stuff we've watched so far. What about you, Moe? Oh, definitely. I mean, I... I've always loved this film. I think part of it is because I do relate to Shizuka because of, well, Shizuku because of the love of books and the desire to be a writer. And that just, that makes me happy. But also it's just such a lovely romance between her and Seiji that just works so well. And I just come away from the film being so incredibly happy. And yeah, I, I, I totally give it an A. It's one of those films that I would say, Definitely give it a watch because it's it's lovely and you will most likely enjoy it. Okay, good stuff, mate. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Tomorrow, though, we have a big movie oh, to cover. Yes. So please join us then when we check out Princess Mononoke. See you then.